Okay, got it. Thank you. Well, Jerry, you're, you're a lifesaver. Somehow my controls have gone off my screen, which is, I'm sure I'll find them later, but I just want to say hello everyone and welcome to a fantastic web webinar. As you can see on the, the um, screen today, we have Well Integrity Basics for Orphaned Wells. We have Dr. Jarrett Wise, who is at Wellbore Integrity Research. He's been doing a lot of work in Wellbore Integrity. And in fact, he studied at University of Oklahoma and OSU in those um, areas. And so we're really, really happy to have him. And we have the renowned uh, author and expert, Les Skinner, who's here from Tekoa Operating. And it's really a pleasure and, and an honor to have him here. He was a part of our very first Orphan Wells conference last um, um, this last February in Oklahoma City. So really, um, really ha happy to have such a distinguished expert, practitioner, and author um, presenting today. So I just want to mention that this is, uh, so we have five sponsors today who are also sponsoring the workshop that we will have in person in February of 2024 in Cranberry, Pennsylvania. And for those of you, of you who may wonder where Cranberry is, it is actually a part of Pittsburgh, but it's not, instead of having to fend off traffic and have the expenses of, of downtown Pittsburgh, we have the beautiful um, suburban uh, area of Cranberry. It's very convenient. So that will be the 27th and 28th of February. And on the 29th, we will have a, um, a training session on, on measurement. And so that's super exciting. We have, um, we have a, uh, five sponsors, Zephyro Methane Corporation, Purvis Energy Advisors, CSR Services, <clears throat> Capstone Well Integrity, and Well Done Foundation. So excited about that. And I also want to mention that this is sponsored also by our Division of Environmental Geoscientists and also our Division of Professional Affairs. So we have um, a, across the APG and we also have support from the um, Pittsburgh Geological Societies. So this is really um, amazing and exciting. So glad to have everyone here. And as we get started, I just want to, to thank everyone. And you'll be receiving an email with a link to the recording and also a link to the event. And we'll start with, uh, with you, Les. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. <laughs> and Les, feel free to go ahead and share your screen. And welcome to everyone. Okay, folks, well, uh, good afternoon, and uh, I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, we're going to be talking about some well integrity basics, and uh, my slides are more or less introductory in nature. The reason that um, I'm putting them on is to try to uh, give you a, a bit of a uh, uh, here you go. A uh, bit of an idea about uh, uh, what we mean by uh, well integrity uh, and how that how that uh, changes. Okay, so uh, if you attended the uh, if you attended the uh, seminar that we had or the meeting that we had in February, you'll recognize a few of these uh, slides. So uh, just, you know, endure it as best you can or uh, uh, enjoy it. Either way, it'll be good for you. So we'll start off this way. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. What is well of integrity? Uh, ISO document 16.530-1 uh, uh, states that it's property or conditions of a well that provide containment. And that's about uh, the size of the entire thing. There was an earlier document, a NORSOG document, that talked about uh, the application of, of solutions to reduce the risk of an uncontrolled release of formation fluid, fluids and well fluids throughout the life cycle of a well. So what do we mean by that? 
So here's a well. A uh, well has barriers, and we're familiar with those. There are two different types of barriers. One of these is a, uh, uh, a, a barrier elements and barrier inflows. Now, barrier element is not intended on its own to, uh, uh, to deal with the pressure or the containment of fluids in a well bore. It has to be combined with something else. For example, if you have a well head that is not installed on the well, basically you've got a, a very heavy door stop sitting somewhere on your location. It has to be combined with casing and with cement to form an effective barrier envelope. Now, what that really boils down to is we have a number of these barriers and we consider the one that's containing the uh, fluid from the reservoir as the primary barrier. And then the other elements or barrier envelopes are secondary. And these barriers can change their function with time. For example, when you're drilling the well and you drill the surface casing and set pipe and cement it in the ground, that's your primary barrier. But as you install uh, other strings of casing, the surface casing is no longer a barrier uh, because it's behind another string pipe. Now, what do you have to have? A lot of times, these barrier systems have been compromised in orphan wells. And in fact, uh, when we do that, uh, when they are compromised, then they're no longer effective and we have to deal with them in some manner. Okay. So what about an orphan well? Here are the six phases of a... Uh, of a well, we're interested in orphan wells, meaning that uh, the uh, orphan well. Uh oh, you need me to start back over, Jared? Yeah, or just continue from where you were. I accidentally closed out on you. Oh, okay. You get back up. Yeah, we're trying to help with the, the display screen. Okay. That there we go. Perfect. Okay. So we're really looking at an orphan well in the intervention phase of the abandonment phase. Now, the ISO 16530 talks about abandonment phase as the end point of the life of a well. And specifically, the uh, uh, the well simply ceases to exist at that time. Well, we know that's not the case. But in the intervention phase, which is where most orphan wells are, we're trying to assure that barriers are maintained, at, at least maintained. But unfortunately, in an orphan well, there's nobody around to maintain them. So a great many of these have deteriorated and the barrier systems have been compromised. Uh, but even in the uh, abandonment phase, there are still barriers out there. Uh, and the method that's used for abandoning the wells often determines whether or not you're going to end up with a, a, a well that doesn't leak. And the abandonment phase is supposed to last until natural barriers take over. And in the February conference, uh, Susan, you may have to help me with this, but I think we talked about something in the neighborhood of 325 million years. So it's incumbent on us when we look at an orphan well to recall that we're dealing with something that may not be healthy and it's going to have to last for essentially eternity. It's hard for engineers to design anything for eternity. We don't have a basis of design for that. Oops. Now I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Um, hmm, that's strange. 
There we go. Try again. Yeah. Here we go. Well, what is the future of most orphaned wells? Right now, the emphasis is on plugging these things as rapidly as we possibly can. There are uh, other uses for orphaned wells. They can be returned to service. They can be used uh, in a different manner. For example, an orphan well might become an injection well of some type. But for the most part, our work is involved with abandoning these orphan wells, getting them off of the uh, out of the inventory. This is what the public is demanding: get rid of all those orphan wells. And for good reason, a lot of them are leaking. If they're not leaking fluids, they're leaking methane. And so there's a great deal of work being done to permanently isolate these downhole reservoirs and to prevent future flows. Well, you normally have to have a permit from a regulatory agency to do that. And they may in fact mandate that the orphan well be plugged. Now, the level of well integrity in the plugged well also has to be restored over such that it lasts for the 325 to 375 million years. But every one of these plugging routines involved barrier systems that were installed during original well construction. Um, looking at orphan wells, some of these wells were drilled shortly after the Civil War in the United States in the late 1800s. Uh, several of the wells in uh, uh, Turkey, for example, were drilled prior to that. So you've got old wells, original well construction, and these things are leaking. So it's incumbent on us to take care of that. Unfortunately, in the petroleum industry, we haven't done a real good job of abandoning wells. In fact, our track record's pretty lousy. So what do we do now? Well, we're trying to get a wall-to-wall -wall plug somewhere in the well board, something that will go all the way across the entire borehole. A lot of operators are uh, doing uh, work to perforate and squeeze a particular spot in a well bore generally right at the base of the surface casing so that the uh, water, the potable water that's trapped behind that surface casing is protected from now on. Well, unfortunately, those surface casing strings are set pretty shallow and they lack uh, the ability to resist fracturing from pressure fluids. So uh, what do we do about the situation in which an orphan well is being considered for uh, some other service, either production or injection, or possibly for carbon dioxide sequestration or some other project. So the other truth behind uh, plugging wells is that operators always try to minimize the cost. Well, nobody likes to pay for a funeral, right? So what happens is we schedule, we design the plugging program to just meet, barely meet the regulatory requirements, minimal effort, minimal cost. And that has resulted in some corner cutting that has caused many of these abandoned wells that were formerly orphan wells to begin leaking. So why would we be concerned about well integrity in an orphan well? Well, the well integrity must be sufficient if you're gonna plug it. You, there are some bare minimums that you have to have. One of those is that you have to install a BOP. Uh, I hope you don't try to work on an orphan well that you don't have a BOP somewhere in place. Many of the orphan wells have been idle. That means they've suffered from deterioration during the time they've been idled. And when I say some time in this slide, that may be for 20 years or more. And the processes that adversely impact well integrity continue. For example, external casing corrosion continues regardless of where the well is, is uh, an active uh, well, whether it's an orphan well or an abandoned well. Some of those processes continue 
on and into the future. And as I mentioned previously, engineers can't really design for eternity. So we have selected a time period of a thousand years when we plug one of these things. So here's an example of a wellhead problem. This particular wellhead, uh, rainwater had collected inside the wellhead and it froze and you can see what happened to it. Pretty ugly. Uh, the, those are the kind of problems we can expect to see. The seals inside a wellhead can leak. The flange bolts can rust completely off, especially on an offshore platform where your bolts are not really holding the head on at all and it begins to leak through the flange. Here's another one. This is a string of production casing. Uh, a BOP was being installed on top of this thing. And you can see that there was enough corrosion, external corrosion and wall thinning that the thing flat buckled in a crushing type failure just from the weight of the BOP stack. And it was a small BOP, incidentally. So when you have things like this occur, you begin to think, well, what does the rest of that casing look like down the hole? And this is a string of pipe inside a pipe. You can see some cement at the top of the pipe. But this is where external corrosion is penetrated completely through the pipe, completely through the casing. Now, when you have a situation like this, obviously, that is not going to be a viable barrier element. So what do we do? Well, we got to either put something on the outside to bolster it, or in this particular case, you can see that the inside pipe is also corroded. We have to run something inside this pipe, usually a cement plug to isolate that zone. So barrier restoration, barriers have to be repaired or replaced. Uh, and defective barriers are often isolated by plugs, either mechanical or cement. Mechanical plugs, uh, at least in some countries, with elastomer elements are not considered barrier elements. They are simply a means to support another barrier element. Uh, the, uh, in Norway, for example, if you put a packer in the hole or you put a bridge plug in a hole, it's not considered a barrier element because it's going to deteriorate over time. Uh, and merely meeting the regulations doesn't ensure that barriers are restored. Uh, recall that all of these regulations are negotiated. Every regulatory agency is run by a politician or politicians, and they are sensitive to pressure, including that imposed by operators when they are asked to spend too much money plugging a well by taking steps that they would normally take on an active well. They just don't want to spend it on abandoning an orphaned well. So it's incumbent upon us as operators to make sure that these orphaned wells don't leak, ever. So here is a uh, on the right hand side is an example of a well that's been plugged. This happens to be one of an orphaned well, depleted reservoir at the bottom. We set plugs in various places, but both the production and intermediate casing have been cut off. Well, in this particular case, we ended up with four separate wall to wall plugs. And the assurance, at least, that uh, the surface, uh, the thing is not going to be leaking. Uh, from well to well, zone to zone, but more especially, it's not going to contaminate fresh water. And then the final plug is that uh, plug number seven, which uh, a lot of times, depending on the depth of the surface casing, plug number seven extends all the way down to plug number six. So we end up at the end of the day with a well bore that is plugged properly, even though this plugging technique goes beyond what the regulatory requirements are. And frankly, as oil and gas operators, this is the kind of thing we're going to have to do if we, to, if we are 
to ensure that that orphan well never leaks. So that's about the uh, all that I've got. I'll stop sharing now, and uh, we can. Uh, are we going to use the chat feature in case of questions, or are you going to just try to work on these at the end, Susan? Um, we'll do the. We'll hold the questions till the end. But I just want to ask everybody to go ahead and use the chat, and then we'll go ahead and and. Um, Jared can start his presentation. So any questions put in either Q&A or in the chat. Hey. So welcome, Jared. Thanks, Susan. All right. Can you guys see my screen OK? Looks great. All right, perfect. So let's talk about a lot of the background of in well war integrity and some of the common things they see in the field. My talks are going to be a little bit more academic in nature. I'll kind of go more towards the research trends, specifically what I've been working on for the past six years in the well war integrity aspect. Uh, all right. So just a little bit about me. I have way too many degrees, but I got my PhD at the University of Oklahoma and then of course, that was during the middle of COVID, so I ended up taking a postdoc position with the federal government and have been here since. So some of the topics we'll discuss today are going through the numerical well integrity models that we've developed. We use them to kind of predict well bore integrity and what factors cause well bore integrity issues. Some then look into gas fluid flow models and cement testing, well bore cement testing. So we'll first look at some of the models. <clears throat> so back when I started my grad school days, my topic of research was, are there well bore integrity issues in the North Sea? Or are there wells leaking? And back at that time, it was kind of not as common knowledge to, at least it was more of a don't ask, don't tell on our well bores leaking. Now like, it's a pretty common thing. So a figure on the screen shows the global methane budget that was produced in 2020, I believe. <clears throat> and shows just kind of the different sources of methane emissions that they measured. And you see there's oil and gas or fossil fuel production use. It counts for roughly one sixth of it. So going to it, like, what wells are leaking. We know there's leaky wells out there, but measurements aren't always publicly available. At least what we've seen, there's a lot of measurements out there, but they're kind of hidden behind company policies. So this is an image that I took from the Carbon Mapper yesterday website. As you can see, there's numerous me measured methane emissions around the Gulf Coast, both onshore and offshore. And just looking at some of these points, you can see like this top one, the Clute, Texas, there's about 400 kilograms an hour of methane leakage. <clears throat> but as you see, they don't really have as much data for the offshore wells. There's probably two dozen measurements out there, but anyone that works with the Gulf of Mexico knows there's a little over 55,000 wells out there. So if they're only able to get about two dozen well recordings, or these could be pipeline recordings, how are these individual wells faring? As Les mentioned, like most of these wells were drilled in the 40s, 50s, 60s, have been abandoned for decades. So there's a lot of integrity issues that we're, we don't know how these wells are faring over time. So that is where our research has come into. So our research is predicting well integrity in these offshore wells. <clears throat> All right. So a broad overview of the leakage mechanisms that at least we were considering in our work is shown on the screen. There's primary leakage mechanisms, which include like incomplete cementing drop, lack of cement plug, failure of the casing by burst or collapse, or cement bonding, channeling, or just permeability in general. Secondary ones include debonding of the cement, fractures, uh, chemical, degradation of the cement, or just even wear or corrosion of the casing. So <clears throat> assuming, so let's talk about the corrosion and failure issues that they've seen in the field. 
from casings and wellheads. Our work assumes that all the materials are just 100% intact. They're done perfectly every time. They're staying perfect. Assuming that what issues can occur during the well's life to cause leakage mechanisms or to cause integrity issues. We know this is kind of an optimistic approach, but we can show that there's integrity issues without all the complex corrosion or failures, then we have a lot more issues than we just know. So from our research and from other researchers we work with, we know that cement debonding occurs in many of the wells we've looked at. Cement debonds from the casing almost instantly. And I'll go through some of the models that show how we know that. So like I said, we created wellbore new wellbore integrity models that replicate the life of the well from the drilling phase to production or drilling, completion, production, abandonment, and just so on. The models are composed of over 25,000 3D quadratic thermoboroelastic elements, which in lamus terms, that just means they include temperature, the pore pressure in the rock, and failure mechanisms. So shear failure, tensile failure, or debonding. On the screen is just a little snippet of the models. It shows like the casing in green, the cement in gray, and then the rock formation. So without getting too in depth with these models, I'll just show results because that's the fun part of this. So we took a well in the Gulf of Mexico. We pulled all of the drilling reports, the production history, everything from it, replicated it with our models, well, after validation and verifying them, of course. We see that cement debonding to the casing occurs, is by far the most common failure mechanism. And it's due to either temperature uh, cycles or pressure cycles. Let me pull up my laser pointer. So. What this assumes is if you have a well bore and it was drilled at, say, 20 MPA mud weight or whatever, and then you produce the well and the drawdown pressure decreases enough over time, which as indicated here, you can go from having a perfectly intact well to start to get a migraine light between the cement and casing just based off your drawdown pressure. Same with temperature. If you drill it at some certain temperature and it has some sort of cycle, such as if you inject something in it or have geothermal, that can also cause microannulite to form. And we've shown that <clears throat> they can actually act together or counteract each other. So if you have a pressure drawdown, but no temperature or the temperature does the opposite, it can negate each other. But if you have both at the same time, they can amplify. So this is all fun and good, but I'm sure most people already know that, of course, if you cycle temperature, cement and steel are going to debond. Steel is very reactive to temperature, cement isn't. Same with pressure, just because the mechanical properties, steel is very elastic versus cement is not. So this makes sense. What we really wanted to go into was what are the, like what factors really affect the microanalyte if you have a drop in pressure. So you just measure or we simulated different pressure drops, varied all the different properties within a well from your hole size, your casing thickness, just your cement properties, rock properties, failure mechanisms, stresses. And what we see is that your casing thickness, the thinner the casing or the thicker the casing thickness, the more significant your microanalyte is going to form, which is coincidentally the same with the hole size. So the bigger the hole, the more likely you're going to get by granulite to form, which like if you have a bigger hole size, you're going to have thicker casing, such as surface casing versus a production casing. We did the same with temperature, and you really don't see as much factors affecting the temperature. Temperature is really pretty stable, well, roughly stable on itself. But this is all still pretty more academic in nature. So how does this actually affect people in the field or affect well bore integrity? <clears throat> so since we're able to replicate the well at one depth, why not replicate it all the way to the top of cement? See, how does the cement bond to the casing from your production 
injection injection points to the top. And the figure here shows that at the very bottom of the well we model, you get a microarray of 23 microns. If you assume there's water or oil or some heavy fluid in there, you really don't get that propagation of microarray. It really loses energy just due to gravity. But if you have, say, a gas field or methane at the source, methane's able to fill that microarray light and just keep pushing it up because it doesn't lose that much energy. So if you start to get a fracture down at the bottom and you have a gas source, it's able to really just grow that microarray light all the way to the top of the cement, creating a full leakage pathway, which that is something that hasn't really been seen before <clears throat> in the academic stance. So <clears throat> how does the complete leakage pathway affect, like, are we seeing leakage at the top? That kind of goes into the next uh, research we have, which is the gas fluid flow models. So with, in an academic sense, like, Assuming there's a microarray has been pretty common. What is also very common is assuming hagen pissouli flow, if you remember from your fluid mechanics days, which is just flow through an annulus, but you assume it's incompressible fluid, so water, basically. You either assume it's horizontal or vertical, where you have to include the effect of gravity on it. So since we saw that methane gas is really what will be our leaking fluid, this isn't a good fluid model to use. So we did a bunch of fun math calculations to develop <clears throat> a similar annular flow model for an ideal gas for both horizontal flow and a vertical. And then we did it for a real gas in which we're including the compressibility factor because with well bores, you're going to have high enough pressures. You really should start considering the effect of compressibility. So with these, these are purely theoretical models, but we wanted to compare them with what we're seeing in the lab. One of our collaborators over in Norway did small scale experiments in which they basically cemented a pipe, so cement casing shut, apply a gas pressure to the top of it and measure the flow at the bottom and measure the different flow rates and pressures for different cement mixtures they had. So we were able to get their data apply our numerical or our fluid flow models, compare it with the water models to see how do these really line up? Do these make sense? And you can see when you're at lower pressures or lower flow rates, they're right on top of each other. But when you start to get to relatively high pressures or high flow rates, you can really see that <clears throat> the gas flow model is significantly different than the water flow model. And this is only at one MPA. The well in the Gulf of Mexico we modeled, I believe was at 30 to 50 MPA. So 50 times this effect. So it really shows that you need to have the right type of models to predict leakage. So how does that really affect the well that we model? This is the same graphic from before, just showing where we had the initial migraine light and the gas propagation versus just assuming it stayed constant the whole way. So if we just assume there's water in it, we're not going to get any leakage, even if there is a fracture path. You just don't have that pressure difference to push water up there. Same if you include like a friction factor with water. If you assume an ideal gas with the same migraine line, you're going to get a little bit of leakage. If you look at the migraine line we predicted with a real gas, you're going to see it's four times larger than what previous research has been doing, which that's significant. It, <clears throat> so if previous research was really underestimating leakage, how can we know what we were looking at? So the this is the point we're at now, where we have these models, we have able to predict leakage from them. Now we're going back and looking at, if we can find a well in the Gulf of Mexico or an onshore well that has major leakage, can we replicate the life of that well? And does the model agree with what we're seeing? If it does, then great. If it doesn't, then we have more work to do. So that's where that research currently is. Uh, let me see, how am I doing on time? Oh, plenty of time. All right, 
So the last part is looking at the wellbore cement. So we show that the cement is really the main failure mechanism, at least in the theoretical perfect scenarios. So ideally, how do you make the cement stronger? So there's different types of bonding mechanisms. This section's gonna get super academic, so I apologize for everyone, but this is interesting enough. So you have tensile bond strength where it just pulls straight apart, shear bond strength where they slide past each other, and hydraulic bond strength, which is a version of tensile bond strength. So in the numerical models, you model using attraction separation law, where you basically have you assume that this is the separation distance between your cement to steel, and this is the stress between them or the force between them, where like right here, everything's bonded, there's no stress on it. As you increase the stress, you're gonna get separation until eventually that bond just breaks and goes past. The aspect that we are really curious about is there's two ways to look at this, either you're going to get an extrinsic model where you're saying that the bond is staying bonded until you hit that max stress and that's breaking, or an intrinsic where there's some sort of linear elastic effect on the cement to bond. And the real way to think of that is basically, is the cement act as a spring? Does it follow Hooke's law where you can start to pull the cement to the steel further apart? and it goes back how it was, unless you hit this critical separation distance. So that's what we were looking at, in which we developed a testing model to basically just have a steel piece of steel bar with cement cured on top of it for two days. We know that's unrealistic, but time is money, and two days is a long time to wait when you're trying to test. And then we just hook the steel to the plate, and hook the cement to the tensile tester and just pull it apart, in which we can measure the force required to pull it apart, and we know the distance it's pulling. So this is some of the data where it just shows this blue is the raw data where all of a sudden it starts to pull and then it snaps and breaks. And you can see that the max stress is roughly 0.8 MPA. <clears throat> but if you really look at it, this is a really linear line, you can see the trend line is matches up 100%. So what this shows is that the cement to steel bond does have an elastic range on it. It does pull apart but come together until you hit this failure point. So if we were to run this test and stop right here, everything goes back to normal and doesn't break, which is the opposite of what the literature says. The literature assumed that there's no separation, just breaks, and that's it. Where we show there's actually a in-between spot where it doesn't break. The fascinating part is this is roughly <clears throat> 500 microns, so about half a millimeter. So you can get half a millimeter of separation before you actually cause that to fail. So that's kind of a high overview look at some of the work we've done. So we had the numerical well integrity life models where we're able to predict factors that cause migranian life formation, migranian life formation along with quantify the fracture width. And we know it's due to pressure and temperature cycles. We have the worked on the gas fluid flow models where we show that you can't model greenhouse gas leakage assuming Hagen Pizzuli flow or water flow. And the fact of, and I didn't cover it here, but in some of the papers, you show that the effect of gravity is actually important on gas flow, which is, you want to think so, since the density is so low. And finally, looked at some of the cement bond testing, which just shows that cement to steel bonding acts as a spring up to about 5.5 millimeters, and then a strain rate effects measurements. And that's all I have. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> I started wondering, thinking back to some of my um, classes and thinking about elasticity of cement and, and the, the nature of the bonds. But anyway, that, that I love the way we can get into the weeds there. Anyway, we have some Q&A. 
Um, okay, so why not 100% cementing after perforation? 100% top to bottom, question mark. You want me to try that one? Yeah. Uh, the density of a full column of cement is probably going to exceed the fracture gradient. So you uh, fill the well with uh, cement from top to bottom, chances are, uh, if you have any weak spots in there, and especially on top of the perforations, something's going to take a drink. And then you end up essentially uh, uh, allowing whatever is the coming from the perforations can then come back in the wellbore. The second reason is that uh, more and more people are realizing that you have to have a base to a cement column. Uh, otherwise, formation fluids and especially gas can migrate through that column before it can actually develop a significant compressive strength. The reason for that is that the gel structure that all cement forms uh, before it begins to cure or to harden and before the, the molecules begin to hydrate supports the column of cement. It supports its own weight. And that means that the hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of that column is zero. So if you have uh, anything that's capable of coming into the well from the formation, that just ensures that you have a, a very long channel or a chimney. And uh, usually it's, it's, uh, it results in leakage somewhere from zone to zone or even out to the surface. So for the most part, people separate this uh, into different plugs, each of which has to have its own integrity. Now, how much uh, cement do you need in a well? How much are you going to pay for that cement? Well, uh, uh, I guess the question then is how much good cement will hold differential pressure? Well, if you're trying to hold, let's say, 10,000 PSI, you really only need about 10 feet of good cement. So why would you want to fill the well bore completely up with cement and then end up with the cost for something that's not necessary? That's kind of a long-winded explanation to say that the idea of setting individual plugs, and especially wall-to-wall -wall plugs, has become the industry standard and not filling the whole well bore with cement. That's a good answer. Interesting. Jared, do you have anything else that you'd like to add or you want to go to the next question? Yeah, I think Les covered it. It's one thing we've seen to notice from an academic standpoint, we always say, just fill the whole thing with cement. Why not? Like in the grand scheme of things, it's a fraction of the cost compared to the drilling procedures, but there's plenty of other issues at that rise. So I think Les covered it very well. Thank you. Um, what are some of the methods and or technologies for preemptively preventing annulus pressure buildup, SCVH, or even worse, gas migration? In other words, best practices and or additives to ensure that gas leak, that gas does not leak, therefore preventing remediation work. I can report that there's been a lot of work done in the North Sea on pumping various materials uh, down that annulus that have essentially the viscosity of water, and they will enter the uh, uh, the leaking area, whatever it is, and ultimately seal it off. Some of these involve biodeposition, which is a a uh, bacteria that basically ends up uh, depositing uh, calcite material of some type in the formation, uh, even into an, a microannulus. And there's been some very good results with that. Uh, other systems include uh, the uh, low melting point uh, metal alloys, primarily bismuth, tin, and some others, there's a couple of systems out there where you end up 
pumping this stuff uh, or it, it, you have to have perforations for the most part in order for that to work. But the whole notion is you put something at the source to plug off the flow. Just pumping something below the wellhead simply, it doesn't relieve the problem. It just pushes it down the hole. And uh, first time somebody tries to perforate somewhere in the wellbore, uh, they get a nasty surprise uh, from accumulated pressure that's below a plug. Excellent. Okay, so next one. Can you elaborate a bit on the use or need of blowout protectors for orphaned well remediation? Yeah, well, you really don't want to go into any well bore without some form of uh, well control protection. Uh, what we have seen uh, on a number of orphan wells is there's a, a blockage that keeps you from seeing the pressure at the surface, but it's still down the hole. Uh, and if you are, for example, interested in cutting off the casing, uh, you may end up with a flow coming up the inside of the casing or up the outside of the casing from uh, trap gas behind the casing that you just didn't know was there. That has been a particular problem in Western Oklahoma, as an example, where uh, a number of the wells, the production casing was uh, severed somewhere below the surface casing. The well didn't have a blowout preventer, and now you've got what amounts to an uncontrolled flow, which uh, kind of negates the idea of uh, sealing these things off. Now you've got a blowout, you've got to control it. And that can get real expensive. Yes, yeah, and dangerous, <laughs> as you pointed out. Um, okay, Christy Clark asks, is it possible for steel and cement in wells from the 50s and 60s to still have me mechanical integrity? Also, does it matter if they, I think it's like, are producing ore shut in? You want to give that one a shot, Jared? Yeah, uh, from our research, the cement is really unlikely to, well, at least on the bond strength side, bonding, it's very unlikely to have good bonding. The thing that really saves, well, quote unquote saves us is the length of cement really reduces down what type of integrity or flourage we might have and kind of if you're in some porous zones, it might leak off into different zones versus coming to the surface. We've recently done some cement work on just looking at the age of cement, like how does it time affect it? And what we're seeing is if you're not having, like if the cement is isolated completely from all fluids and everything else, it's very easy for it to be bond. But if it, does come in contact with other fluids, it significantly helps it. So it just kind of depends. But all of my stuff has been from the two days to 28 days, and you're talking 60 years. So I would assume that there's some mechanical integrity, but you have no idea what you might see. Yeah, and I, uh, I would support that. You really don't know until you get down there, but we have wells in this country they're over 100 years old and they're still producing. And as far as we know, there is still mechanical integrity of the casing on those wells. Now, uh, I was involved in plugging one just recently, it was 62 years old. The casing was in remarkably good condition. The well was not leaking. We didn't have any flow at all. So it can occur, but eventually uh, all of the casing is, is going to corrode uh, if you stop and think about a galvanic cell, the casing itself is one leg of that galvanic cell, and uh, water from formations, especially those down the hole, if there is any leakage, it's going to form a galvanic cell with the upper part of the wellbore being the anode and the lower part of the well being the cathode, and eventually all of that casing is going to be corroded away. Will it occur in our lifetimes? I have no idea. But 
we have seen some wells that have uh, good mechanical integrity after several decades. Now, I will also tell you, I have seen wells that are three months old where uh, the mechanical integrity of the entire well bore has been compromised. So it depends, and Jared's right about that. It, you really don't know. That's really fascinating. Okay, once a well is plugged, most operators have, have it written off their books. Is there any suggestion on tools or monitors monitoring to alert operators if a plugged well is leaking prior <laughs> to notification from a regulatory agency or an environmental event? Yeah, so that's actually what funded my PhD was the Norwegian government was wanting this type of tool for the North Sea. So they were wanting to see if there's ways to predict like, if wells are having issues so they can go focus on them. So that's kind of what all of our work went on. Granted, all of ours is offshore, so it's impossible to get there, harder to measure everything. So I don't know, I'm not familiar with onshore, so Les will probably be better on that. Well, the, uh, the public is a very good source of information on leaking plugged wells. And uh, the regulatory agency is normally the first one that they call, whether they have jurisdiction over that well bore or not. Uh, so we uh, and I have been involved in several wells that started leaking after they were plugged in uh, New Mexico. But something changed down the hole in uh, one well, for example, uh, an offset operator was water flooding and he happened to be injecting above parting pressure. So the water was simply fracturing the formation. It got over into an old well bore and basically it blew the cap off the thing. So uh, then we were obliged to solve that problem. And uh, basically what we did is uh, we had the uh, operator shut off his injection wells. Sure enough, we were able to get the thing under control. So uh, yeah, the, the public is a good way. If you have leakage, of something like methane, as an example, you're able to pick that up on any one of a number of different type of sensors. And uh, uh, especially in an orphan well, you can you can see a methane plume from a long way off. Uh, the guys at Well Done Foundation are experts at locating orphan wells that are leaking and flood wells that are leaking. But normally if uh, uh, we have some plug wells that are simply cut off below ground, and you never know. Uh, one uh, commenter back in the February conference mentioned that there were some of these orphan wells and actually plug wells too that were located under state highways. And one day the public noticed that there was oil flowing down the bar ditch. So uh, that necessitated tearing up a highway to get to the well to replug the thing. So uh, there are all sorts of sources of information about uh, leaking plugged wells. On some of them that are leaking underground from zone to zone, we just never know about them until they make their way to the surface or we have some other indication from an offset well. You know, that's kind of interesting. If the well had enough dry to make put the get the water the the um, oil all the way to the, the bar ditch it makes you wonder why they plugged it in the first place. <laughs> but anyway, um, okay, so maybe I missed it, but how do we know that's not the rock elas elastically deforming? Um, that's from Tom Postman. I'm not sure if there is enough information in that question to answer it. <laughs> yeah, I assume it's on the numerical modeling, trying to determine the mic granuli. If I'm wrong, correct me. But so we, at least on the theoretical side, we know the rock is, or the rock is elastically deforming, but the rock and cement are very similar. Like the, if you look at the mechanical properties, both rock and cement are comparable. Versus if you look at casing, it's at least an order of magnitude higher. So if your rock and cement are deforming, they're gonna move similar to each other which isn't necessarily going to create leakage pathways, but I'm sure there's scenarios in which that could occur. 
that's why we, at least why we theorize why we see a lot of it between the cement and casing is just because there's such a drastic difference between the mechanical properties, which it seems like casing is the underlying component in a lot of well-born integrity issues where it doesn't really want to be down there and it doesn't interact with the fluids down there very well. But you need some sort of structural stability to help hold everything together and keep things where they need to be. Okay, there are so many questions in the chat. We have time for two or three more. Maybe I could let you guys choose <laughs> which ones. I mean, here's one that maybe could apply to a lot of things. If you have an orphan well that does not have any logs available, what logs would you run to determine a sound pl plugging program? CVL, et cetera? Yeah, um, I'll make a run at that. The first thing you want to know about an orphan well is whether or not it's flowing. Uh, because if you're going to do anything to the orphan well, those barrier systems have to be reinstalled. So I think there's about four tools that I would consider running on an orphan well to as a kind of a pass fail. One of those would be some sort of EMI casing inspector, like a casing collar locator. Simple tool. Every wireline string has one in it. They're widely available. People know how to use it. And uh, to determine the condition of the casing, really all you have to do is turn the gain up on the EMI tool. It's going to spike pretty badly when it hits a casing collar locator, but at least you'll, from the nature of the output, you're going to be able to see if you've got some thin spots. They will also identify holes in the pipe uh, because the magnetic flux that's associated with that comes out perpendicular to the center line of the pipe. So you're going to see areas with a uh, poor uh, wall thickness, loss of metal, and you're also going to be able to see holes. The second tool is a uh, temperature log, uh, and coupled with that is a uh, downhole hydrophone, the so-called noise temperature log. You're looking for flow, and you can tell from the output of that log whether it's gas or water because they flow at different frequencies. And about the third or the fourth tool I think I'd run uh, would be a gamma ray to see what the lithology is if you have some bad spots in the pipe. Uh, you can get an indication from the gamma ray, especially if you have another well nearby that you compare it with. But more than that, I think I'd be looking at the field itself and saying, do we have a history of casing leaks in this field? Uh, is there a zone of an aquifer that's particularly uh, corrosive in nature? Has there been any uh, uh, indication of uh, H2S or CO2 production uh, in the area? Uh, is there water injection going on somewhere that could have soured a formation, for example? And the same thing is true offshore. You want to look for indicators like that that give you a first shot. If you begin to see some problems, you can always go back and get diagnostic tools that are much better and much more specific. But at the first glance, I'd run those four tools in the hole. Uh, of course, after running a, a gauge ring in a junk basket to make sure you can get down. Excellent. Um, well, here's one more question and then I'll have um, each of you look through the chat and pick out one that you'd like to answer that hasn't been answered yet or in the Q&A. And then basically, what is channeling and cementing caused by? And um, Salim Shaker is asking if is it due to pressure differential compartmental, compartmentalizations or? Um... Yeah, that's a good question. From my knowledge on channeling anyway, is when you don't have a heavy enough cement mixture, where you have the gas is able to kind of permeate through the slurry before it really gets time to make that matrix in there. And to kind of answer your 
I think it's part of your question, right? We haven't looked at channeling at all. We assume that when they do the cement, it's everything's perfect. The wellbore is nice and centered and everything's happy go lucky. So there's a lot of limitations to our modeling, but that's a good point that channeling can definitely play an effect. Do you have experience with channeling, Wes? Oh yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, I've talked to couple of industry professionals say in gas wells, you're going to have some channeling. Primary to that is the fact that Portland cement shrinks. Uh, when you go through the hydration process of the individual molecules that make up the uh, cement, the actual cured or uh, hard cement actually occupies less space than the slurry did. So you're going to start with cement uh, trying to withdraw, and if you have, if you're in a closed annulus, for example, you end up pretty much off the bat with uh, a microannulus of some kind. First researcher that worked on that uh, was a French guy in 1900, and he estimated that it uh, spent shrunk about five percent. Well, that's enough to initiate a microannulus, and then the things you talked about, Jared, about pressure, it, uh, it's that microannulus is going to grow, but channeling, true channeling, is basically when you have bulk flow of a reservoir fluid through the slurry uh, before it has a chance to uh, cure. And we use several tools to try to avoid that. Uh, some of the best ones are expansive addicts, uh, additives, like uh, magnesium oxide is an example. But uh, there are other materials that can also prevent gas from uh, channeling through cement. Those are commercially available and some of them have uh, uh, properties that are uh, proprietary. But uh, for the most part, the idea is to get the cement in place and get a, uh, a fast cure on the cement before you end up with gas or oil or water being able to channel up through it. That makes sense, especially when you, in the point you make about kind of like the reservoir fluid, the, the, the chemistry, the, the fluid chemistry and what it does. Anyway, um, okay, so as you looked at some of the um, questions, Les and Jarrett, were there any that jumped out that you'd like to answer? Uh. <clears throat> the channeling with the models was probably going to be mine, but you already asked that one. <laughs> Let's see. One that I think is interesting that I don't have the answer to is the cost associated with plugging, like the equipment, mm -hmm. bonding. Do you have an idea on that one, Les? I'm sorry, Jared. Uh, can you try me again? I'm having some trouble with my speakers. Yeah. It says, could you please provide a sense of aggregate plugging cost, uh, integrity analysis, remediation design basis, materials, procurement, construction and equipment purchase, or rental, and insurance or bonding costs for orphan wells? So basically, how much does it cost to plug an orphan well? Well, that's an open-ended question. I hope I can <laughs> give you some sort of idea behind it. In the in shallow, simple wells, you may be able to spend twenty thousand dollars or less on plugging an orphan well. Those costs are going up, incidentally, every day. But on some of the more complex orphan wells, the deeper ones with multiple casing strings, multiple leaks, uh, you, you may spend. Uh, quarter of a million dollars on one of them. So there's such a wide range and it's all dependent on the condition of the orphan well uh, and how deep it is. Uh, even workover rigs are expensive when they're used for multiple days trying to get plugs in some of these wells. And the reason is that sometimes the plugs don't want to stay where you leave them. They have this annoying tendency to go somewhere else. But uh, in order to get an effective plug in an orphan well, 
you're going to have to fashion the procedure to fit the conditions of the well itself. And that means your cost can vary significantly uh, depending on what those conditions are. Sorry, I can't get any more specific than that. Um, we've had a couple of wells that were almost identical. One of them cost us $34,000 to plug. The next one cost us $134,000 to plug. So they're all over the place. Yeah, that's pretty terrifying. And, and you know, I often used to, to think, well, you know, what's the bond that you have a bond you can't isn't that enough but apparently you know obviously it's well it's not I mean we're talking about orphan wells and I'm thinking just in the case of of plugging your own wells um a lot of times if it's an older well the bond that was required at the time is a lot less than than what's required now yeah, that's very true. And uh, the regulatory, all of the regulatory agencies are suffering from budget deficits as a result of bonds that were uh, taken out decades ago that are far too small to pay for the present day plugging cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when, when I was uh, a few years ago, even a few years ago in Oklahoma, it was just 25000 per well. Anyway, that's what we put when I, when I was operating um okay so moving to plug problem why not use foam cement and then that, i think this will be our last one <laughs> but you got to realize that the uh it depends on what you're using the cement for foam cement is wonderful stuff but it has a a, a lower compressive strength than uh cement without the gas dissolved in it the good part about uh, the foam cement is that while the cement is curing, the gas that's in there can expand to replace uh, any pressure that's being applied. So you don't end up with that zero hydrostatic uh, pressure. You end up with the pressure that the gas is going to be able to uh, expand and, uh, and help to prevent gas or formation fluid from contaminating the, the cement column. Uh, one of the, uh, I can't remember if it's, uh, and I'm quoting Halliburton products here, I think, so forgive me for that. One of them is gas check and one of them is gas block. And one of those two actually has a material in it that uh, uh, generates gas. So you pump the slurry and then as it cures, the uh, uh, there's gas being generated within the slurry itself. So that's kind of, a, a, it's a little bit different system than foam cement, but it has the same effect. Excellent. Well, and I would think that too, if you think about the physical properties over time, there's going to be volumetric change with the foam. Like, um, okay, so this is great. I want to thank um, Jarrett Wise, Wellbore Integrity Research, and Les Skinner, Tecoa Operating, for an amazingly informative webinar. I just really, really appreciate it. And looking forward to the February Pittsburgh meeting. It'll be amazing. And I want to thank our, our um, sponsors, Zafiro Methane, Purvis Energy Advisors, CSR Services, Capstone Well Integrity, and the Well Done Foundation. So thank you, and thank you, everyone. You'll be receiving a, a link to the recording. And I would like to encourage you to um, reach out to Les and Jarrett directly for if you, some of your questions were not answered. We could have gone on for another hour, I think. <laughs> At any rate, a wonderful job. And thank you, everyone. Bye, guys.